everyone, I am James Milan. Welcome to Talk of the Town. Uh, in this episode, uh, those of you who have maybe have seen Talk of the Town recently um, might find that this is a familiar setting because we are back with our guest today, Jack Johnston, in his living room once again. Uh, our last chat was about three weeks ago. We promised at that time that we would be returning and here we are. Um, so we had a wonderful uh, conversation with Jack, uh, who is a 90-year-old resident of Arlington, having been here for a very long time. Uh, our last conversation was all about World War II in Arlington, its impact on the local community, and Jack's own experience. It was wonderful. I suggest that you check it out if you haven't already. Um, but we are back today as promised, to talk about Jack's baseball career, another way to see also the history uh, of our country and our culture and our society uh, over these last oh, number of decades, Jack being an active participant through much of that. So, with that as a preface, we're back. Thanks so much for opening the door to us again. Okay. We really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to this conversation, which will be largely about baseball, but again, touching on so many other things uh, that, uh, that people are going to be curious about, I have no doubt. Okay. Um, so if I can ask you, Jack, just start at the beginning. I, I will say that I know that you had a career that, was, that included both playing and then scouting and doing other kinds of functions in the front office um, for... A couple of teams that people will have heard about, and we'll talk about that. Okay. But start us in Arlington with you as a kid. Okay, I, I, I hope you don't mind my talking from notes because I, I absolutely wanna, I you're wanna, allowed. Uh, give, give you the my baseball path from beginning to today. Okay. Uh, like all kids who are interested in baseball, uh, I started out with with my chums from morning till night just playing pickup baseball, most of it down at Spy Pond Field. Uh, there was no Little League back then, and uh, the first organized baseball in Arlington was uh, the AYA, Arlington Youth Association. It was a, uh, uh, a, an effort from the Arlington Auxiliary Police, and uh, we had a schedule, we had uniforms and equipment, and that was my first uh, exposure to an organized team. Um, Which, as you say, it was not, there was no structure, so you started playing in the same way, even I, you know, I, um, I'm uh, a couple of decades behind you, but I remember very unstructured play right. uh, being part of my childhood. Right. That, that is much less the case now, as we know. Yes. And so you got into organized through this AYA, which was sponsored by the Auxiliary Police. Arlington Auxiliary Police. Arlington yes. Auxiliary Police. If you can, and if you can't answer this, that's fine. Do you know what the Auxiliary Police, Arlington Auxiliary Police were? What, what, what was that? No, I don't. Entity? I don't know. They were, they were good adults. <laughs> okay, they were nice adults. That's yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, on. that's all right. I remember the auxiliary police were present at the uh, high school rec dances in place of regular police. Okay. So they maintained order. I, I guess. So I, they were like police adjacent people. I guess so. <laughs> I don't even know if they exist today. Yeah, I think pro I, I I expect not, but maybe crossing guards were among those. You know, there there are a number of people who kind of operate on the periphery of what the police do. So. Right. Right. Well, my next exposure to uh, organized baseball uh, was not at the high school. I had to have a, uh, an after-school job to help out at home financially. And uh, my, I did participate in post-39 American Legion baseball. Uh, and I uh, was very fortunate to have a coach uh, by the name of Henry Doyle, Hank. We called him Hank Doyle. He was a former catcher at uh, Boston College, and he was the one that really taught me the basics of uh, pitching. So that was uh, an important step. Mm -hmm. um, can I can I ask you something, Jack? Um, I know that your own thought. So clearly, the, where this story is headed is that you you were a professional baseball player. Yes, and. 
So clearly you have, you, you have talent that the rest of us don't have um, in order to be able to get to, that, to, the, to those heights. Um, where did your interest in baseball specifically and where did your athletic ability come from, if you can? My dad played professional soccer for Manchester City. What? <laughs> My goodness. Uh, he was That's also, a distinction. Yeah, he was also a Mason. And one of the members of the lodge in Boston was Bobby Doerr, second baseman for the Red Sox. So there was Hall the of time. Fame second baseman for sure. Yes, Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a connection. But my dad was a professional soccer player. Okay, but you were you were born into this or or raised in this culture, right? right? And so probably well, soccer wasn't big in this country when I was small. It is now, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, back then it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, my dad used to play keep away with the soccer ball without the diving to catch it. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably fun for all of you, at least yeah, for a while. Yeah, but that's probably where the athletic talent came from. That's great. And did your dad have, did he voice any opinions about, you know, the fact that he had been a, a football player at, at back Not to, really. And, and, okay. I didn't find out until he had passed away that he even pat, played in Manchester. Is that right? And I, yeah, I've written to the Manchester club and I have a letter that I'll show you with the number of goals that he scored. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'll tell you, that was, that, that's, I, I knew that we would have little nuggets that we would uncover <laughs> here. There's one of them. Uh, uh, as I said, I played Legion Ball. Um, in uh, 1950, I tried out for the uh, National Hearst team at Fenway Park, and I was one of 75 New Englanders that were picked at Braves Field. And then uh, the finals were at, uh, semifinals were held, held at Fenway, and I made that. And then I played in uh, Yankee Stadium in the finals. Wow. Uh, you've heard of Hearst publications. And yes, so of the course. They were the first. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they were sponsoring this competition, basically? Yes. Yeah. It was called the Hearst, Hearst National Team. Yeah. Do you have memories of playing at Yankee Stadium at that time? Barely. Barely. Okay. Yeah. Stayed at a hotel, but that was about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I received a, a four-year scholarship to Boston University and played four years of varsity baseball at, at uh, BU. Um, was that I, unusual at that time to play yes, all four years? Usually played J JV baseball and then the last three would be varsity. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jack, I'm, I'm going to ask you, clearly you were talented enough to do that, to play for four years, which people don't usually. If anybody right now was on a trajectory to head towards the uh, MLB, they would be being mm, be, be treated differently from when they're quite young because of their talent, because people would see that that, that that was something that was very distinctive and they would have a different course probably uh, uh, than, other, than others of their peers um, in terms, again, of the way that they were treated. Was that at all the case back then? Did you feel, were you being treated as a special... Uh, talent in any I way? I think I was an exception. I won't say special. I was an exception. Today it's not. It's not. It's not unusual for a talented player to play four years of varsity baseball. I'll give you an example when I get to that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I had the win winningest record at, uh, at BU during those years. Uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I had the experience of playing for St. Georges de Beauce in Quebec. A uh, thoroughly French-speaking community, and uh, I used to draw the curtains at the local movie theater to justify getting paid and remaining an amateur. <laughs> but uh, the people up there were wonderful to us. Uh, they showed up with a paper sack or plastic sack with a loaf of bread, wine, and cheese. And when one of our players hit a home run, they passed the hat and gave them. Oh, uh, they were wonderful people. Wonderful people. I really enjoyed playing up there. That's, that's a great story. And, and again, you just said it in passing, but at that time, you needed to maintain your amateur status, but yes. you also needed to be able to... Which they do down the Cape now, the Cape mm -hmm. Cod League. Mm -hmm. The players come in and they have some kind of a 
nonsense job. Yes, a kind of show job in yeah, a sense yeah, where they get. Yeah. And in your case, it was drawing the curtains at the at the local, at the local movie theater. theater. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Um, I started the very first baseball game at Nickerson Field, which is BU's. Back then, it was BU's field. They had just purchased it from the. Uh, uh, Boston Braves. The Braves had moved out to Milwaukee, mm -hmm. and so BU bought that. They renamed it Nickerson Field, and I got to pitch the first game against Boston College. We got as far as the seventh inning, and the lights went out, and there were no electricians to turn them back on. So the game was called, and people went home. But fortunately, we were ahead in the at that point, and we were credited with the win. But that was a memorable I bet. night. Yeah, the place. Total darkness, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And and uh, again, it was brand new, flashlights. brand new facility. So it's not like people well, knew their way around. New. It was not new. It was neglected. Uh, okay. Up when BU bought it, it was in tough shape. Mm -hmm. But uh, you said that you pitched the first game, so yeah. it wasn't like people were used to the venue or anything at that <laughs> yeah. point. Uh, not a forgettable night when the lights go out. Um, while I was at BU. Um, I have to bring in Ted Williams. Ted Williams dislocated a shoulder in spring training and they sent him back to uh, Boston. Part of his rehab was to hit in Fenway Park. So I was one of the pitchers that was sent there the, uh, as a right-hander and from BC it was a fellow by the name of Buckley. He was a left-hander and we went over to uh, Fenway in our uniform pants and uh, Got to pitch to the great Ted Williams. He did it for two days, and he played pool with us. He said, uh, throw the ball down the middle of the plate, and he'll say, this is going to left, the next pitch this is going to center, the next pitch he... So he put on a display. Wow. And at the end of it all, he gave uh, Buckley and myself 20 bucks a piece, which was a lot of money back then. And uh, we did that two days. That is... Fantastic. That was Ted Williams. <laughs> so, not many folks can say that they pitched to Ted Williams, <laughs> is all I can say. My goodness. Um, in late 1955, I signed with Baltimore and uh, was assigned to the San Antonio of the Double A Texas League. And that only lasted six weeks because I got called into the Air Force. Uh, I was in ROTC, Air Force ROTC at, at BU, and uh, had to heed the call. So and I lasted. This was the 1950s, you said. This was 1955. Mm -hmm. At the end of, I signed in 55, reported in 56. Uh, I should mention that uh, recently, within the last month, Brooks Robinson died, Hall of Fame third baseman for Baltimore. He was our third baseman. <laughs> signed out of Little Rock High School in Arkansas. Is that right? So he was the third baseman on the San Antonio affiliate yes, that you yes. played? So you played with him as well? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, not for long. <laughs> he, he was not forgettable. Right. I yeah. bet. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it lasted six weeks. And then, as I said, I was called up to active duty in the Air Force. Um, I sp spent almost four years in the Air Force. And then when I got out, I signed a contract with the uh, Spokane Indians of the Pacific Coast League. They're the, the Dodger AAA affiliate. Mm -hmm. And uh, my second year there, I suffered a, a career-ending arm injury, and they did not have the uh, uh, Tommy, Tommy John, John surgery, surgery right? that is almost routine today. Mm -hmm. Kids in high school get it. Uh, when they hurt their arms. So that wasn't available in it for all practical purposes. That was the end of my pitching career. Can I, can I ask you, Jack, sorry, um, sorry to interrupt again. Um, you had to, you were just starting on a professional baseball career, which I assume was something that you'd been aiming at and something you were excited about. Yes. When you were called up, as you said. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that was for you? Um, was it, was it, as simple as, oh, well, I wanted to do this, but I need to do that, and so therefore, that's that? Or was it... I tried to try it, mm -hmm. but didn't. It didn't win. Okay. Yep. So you tried to say, hey, I'm, I'm busy here. Uh, no, it didn't make any difference. Okay. Yeah. 
And I, that's the way they treated everybody. It wasn't that I was being singled out. Right. They had treated Ted Williams like that, uh, you know, years Well, he years served two years. Mm -hmm. So he lost two years off of a tremendous career. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so th thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, one of the benefits that came out of my time in Spokane was I, had a, I developed a very good relationship with Bobby Bregan, who was my manager. Uh, we got along very well, and I think he respected me. Anyway, he, when he left the Dodger organization, he became the first director of player personnel with the uh, Houston Ball Club, the, of the, the brand new Houston Ball Club, uh, Houston Colt 45s, now the Astros. Mm -hmm. Okay, The Colt 45s, yeah. Right. So I got a telephone call one names. day from Bobby saying, uh, I'm looking for a scout in the New England area, are you interested? And I said, I don't know anything about scouting. He said, I'll pair you up with an experienced scout, which he did, and then you're on your own. Uh, I had a humongous territory that I didn't like, mm. but that's the way they decided things. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Bobby left the organization, for whatever reason, I left as well. And as luck would have it, uh, the Mets scout in this area became very ill. Mm. And so I applied for and got the, the job with the Mets, which I had for 30 plus years. Man. Yeah. And I have to say, uh, I'm sure you'll talk about it, but those 30 plus years include both World Series titles for the Mets and got World the Series second of rings, those. which I've passed on to each daughter. They, uh, the young one has the '69, which is her birth year, and the older one has the '86. So, the '86. Some folks around here might remember that one too. <laughs> we don't. I don't know how long, how much we'll be able to talk about that, but I'd like to. We'll see. <laughs> I was being treated for cancer at Mount Auburn Hospital, and part of the process was to have uh, things implanted and uh, the physician that came in to do that the first thing he asked for was had I signed a consent form which I hadn't they hadn't presented to me so I was under the some sedation and he just handed me the clipboard and said sign it so I did and he noticed the 86 World Series ring on my finger and he said, that's a, an interesting ring. What college is it? And I said, it's not a college ring. It's a World Series ring. And uh, he said, what World Series? And I said, well, 1986. He said, 1986, that's the Mets. And I said, yes, it is. He's, and then he cursed me <laughs> and said, you've got a nerve coming into this hospital. I know he was joking. And that, right, of course. And how many years later was that? You know, that was, that was probably many, many years after the debacle of 1986. But nobody around here is going to forget that. Oh, I know they won't. <laughs> I don't bring it up. Uh, I want to tell you my biggest disappointment in, in scouting. Uh, and it was the failure to sign uh, first baseman Carlos Pena. Carlos came to the United States when he was 12 from the Dominican Republic uh, with his parents and siblings. And uh, they settled in Haverhill. I ran a tryout camp uh, for the Mets in Haverhill. And there were hundred some kids that showed up from around, uh, mostly from the Merrimack Valley, but some as far away as Maine and uh, some from New Hampshire. But it was a large group. And in order for it to, uh, to get through that many players, you have to cull out uh, a number of them. And the best way to do that is to time them over a, a running stretch. And uh, if they don't qualify in terms of the time, then... Right, then you've, then you've <laughs> successfully called some. Right. So anyway, they fill out their player information cards, and then as the, each one of them runs, we record the time. Carlos ran. I looked at his card, and it was, when I did look at it, it was awful. Uh, his father came over to me uh, towards the end of the day and said, uh, can Carlos hit? And I looked at his card, and I said, you know, he can't run. And I looked over at the bench, and Carlos was crying. Mm. And uh, he's just at the end of his sophomore year. 
and uh, I don't want to send any kid away from a trial camp crying. So I said, when everybody else is done, we'll keep a couple of pitchers and he can hit. That was fine. You know, he got up to the plate and the Haverhill Stadium, baseball stadium, runs into the football field. He started hitting things up into the football grandstands. Wow. Now, we talk. Right. And uh, I said, I told him, I said, uh, you're never going to play in the big leagues if you can't run. Baseball, you have to be able to run. And uh, he never forgot that. And the next thing, I, because I checked on him, I found out that he uh, had gotten involved with a uh, former Patriots defensive back who lived in, now lived in Haverhill. Hmm. And I've forgotten his name, but he taught Carlos about balance. Hmm. He strengthened his legs by having him jump from the table to the ground and back and forth. And he was a different kid by the time he was a senior. He went to Wright State, got homesick, came back here, and then Neil McPhee, the Northeastern coach, knew of him, and Neil gave him scholarship to Northeastern, and he majored in electrical engineering, as I recall, a bright, bright wow. person. And uh, by the time he was a senior at Northeastern, he was so polished. Anyway, we had a, a, a tryout, and our general manager at the time didn't rank him high enough, and we lost him to the Texas Rangers. They picked ahead of us, and they, mm -hmm. they took him. Uh, he was uh, number 10 in the first round. He had a 14-year career in the big leagues. He uh, was an all-star in 2009, and he led both leagues in home runs in 2009. So uh, he's now, he does broadcasting for MLB. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's just, a, was a terrific person. The, I really grew to like the family. Uh, so I was so disappointed that we did not get him. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest scouting disappointment. There mm -hmm. were others, but that was a major one. Well, it's a good illustration of a lot of uh, both what, you know, the work that you were doing, but also just how how contingent everything is. Yeah, and, and, well, I followed him after that way. tryout camp. I followed him right through high school, mm -hmm. and all I could see was an upward curve. Mm -hmm. He was really a, a heck of a player, and mm -hmm. then to lose him because he wasn't ranked high enough by the, the upper echelon. Right, and as you said in 2009, if the guy hits that many home runs, he can take as much time as he wants going around the bases. That's he doesn't right. have to be able to run fast. So. Uh, the very best thing that happened to me during my uh, scouting career was my marriage. Uh, uh, we met at uh, Boston University where I was studying for my MSW. She was on the staff at the School of Social Work. And uh, she was interested in baseball. And uh, the joke in our family was that, uh, well, first of all, her, her dad was the uh, director of the Yale Divinity School Library, and he was an ordained minister. So the joke was the only cardinals they knew about were in Rome. So <laughs> that, was, that was that. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I introduced her to professional baseball, and my, the ultimate test was I took her to four games on a Saturday. Uh, we didn't stay for the full games, just fought me in the lineups and then moved on to the next, to the line, through the lineup, moved on to the next, but I took her to four games, and I figured if she could endure that, she could, we could be together. <laughs> so. Yes, that was a trial by fire for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was interested in, in baseball all the years that we were together. We met people that uh, she ordinarily would never have met. And uh, we had two wonderful daughters that still have them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, well, she passed away in April of this year. But uh, she really loved baseball. Mm -hmm. She got to go to World Series. And Absolutely. <clears throat> it's a very, it, 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 I'm sure she loved you first. Yes. Uh, obviously, but you know the fact that she would love something that you are making your life in for a while, that, yeah. was, a, that was very serendipitous. Yeah, she was on the verge of writing a cookbook, it was called Home Plate, and uh, she didn't get to finish that. Uh, I hope my daughters do. Yeah. Uh, she was 
Yeah, I hope so too. You know, we are getting near, as always, the end of our conversation. Okay. I want to make sure that we don't forget anything that you want to include. But I did also have another question for you. So let me ask you to, first of all, to like, is there something that you want to make sure that we, that gets mentioned that we haven't yet? Yeah, I, I think for me, baseball has been all about relationships. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, getting to know Cocky people Spen, in, yeah, in yeah. the, uh, especially Peter Abraham. But oh. He's a veteran sports writer and. Uh, uh, Right, a globe, the Globe's sports writer. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, and we talk about sports issues. I maintain contact with uh, uh, people who are actively scouting. I hear from them all the time. I hear from a few coaches. I've had uh, a coach bring in a player to talk about pitching and things of that nature. Uh, and I just got a lovely card from uh, Tom Freeman. Tom Freeman grew up in Arlington, a right-handed pitcher. He went to Bates College. He was an All-American at Bates College. We tried to sign him. The Yankees got him. And I hadn't seen him for 60 years. Six and zero? Six zero years. Right. Uh, he saw that Marsha had passed away, and I got this lovely card for him. He telephoned me. Now we're going to get together. He's coming up here uh -huh. in November. He lives down in Fort Myers. And he's coming up here sometime in November. I think he has a brother that lives somewhere up here. But anyway, his card just That's wants amazing. to get back together again. You know, we, in our last conversation, we talked about the fact that you you and your family had a relationship with sailors that you met um, oh, during World War II that right. endured for decades, so has this one. That says something about you for Six, sure. 60, 60 years. Yeah, that's... Yeah. That's quite a testament to who yes, you are as well, I have to say. Yeah. I know you're a right. modest guy, you don't want to be <laughs> saying anything, but that's really, that, that does say a lot about yeah. people's regard for you, your ability to sustain those relationships over a long yeah. period of time. It's really... Yeah. Well, they're good people. They're good people. Yeah. I'm so. talking to one as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And that's, um, that's all I have. So my last question is... is it, it, it may not. It may be too hard to answer, but um, you're an Arlington native, uh, essentially a native, and so therefore a Boston native. You worked for the New York Mets for many years, including that memorable World Series we've already alluded to. How was that for you? Uh, were you ever? Was that? Did that? Did that create any? We had great for you? relationships with people at Fenway Park. Uh, one in, one woman in particular over there called a, quite a, I think two or three weeks after the funeral, she said, I didn't know what to say. She was that close to um, Marsha, my wife, and she said, that's why I delayed calling you. And she said, I didn't know what to say. And I used to talk about uh, knitting and recipes and stuff like that. So you were not subject to, so you, you, you told that anecdote about the doctor who was like, how dare you come in here oh, you, no, with no, your no, no, World no, Series. No, no. You were not subject to actually any actual hostility no. from Bostonians Never. or anything like Never. that at any point. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. Rich Beaton, who was the, uh, I guess his title is Vice President of uh, Tickets and Promotions for the Red Sox. He once said to, uh, he said to Marsha, he said, you people never ask for anything. He said, anytime you want tickets, it doesn't matter whether it's regular games or the World Series, just call me. Oh. Again, so there was no animosity over it. Great, great. Well, you know, Boston fans, as we all know, don't have the best reputation for how they treat uh, folks from other cities and other teams, etc. So uh, Jack is here to tell us all that that's not necessarily the case on a person-to-person -person basis. No, and no, things went no. really well for you, even though you had your Mets banner out there, I'm sure, right in front yes, of you. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, Jack, um, I'm going to come up with some excuse to come back and talk to you again. I just <laughs> am sure of it. Um, I have been speaking with Jack Johnston. He is, uh, as we have said before, a very long-time resident of Arlington with so many stories to share. 
Uh, we have plumbed some of the depth of that, and uh, we really appreciate Jack's time for it. But as I said, we're going to figure out other reasons to come back and talk to him. So thank you so much again for welcoming us You're into your welcome. house. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. We really appreciate it. Um, this is Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. We'll see you next time. Thank you.